Are you troubled by pop culture references you don't understand? Does trying to figure out a good jumping on point in a long running comic series keep you up at night? Have you or your friends or family seen a comic book based movie, TV show, or cartoon and not known what was going on? If the answer is yes, then this is the podcast for you. My Big Fat Pull List. Our assembly of knowledgeable hosts are eager to help answer all your comic book based pop culture questions. We're ready to geek out with you! The DC Universe. It can be a complicated and sometimes convoluted place. There are hundreds of characters, both heroes and villains, all with rich origins and histories. But after 80 years of stories, the DC Universe doesn't have the easiest continuity to understand. Why were classic heroes so violent? Why are there two guys named The Flash? If Superman didn't become a hero until he was an adult, then how is it he was a member of the Legion of Superheroes as Superboy? And exactly what are the true origin stories of such confusing characters like Hawkman, Wonder Woman, Condiment King, and Captain Mar- I mean Shazam? We will attempt to dissect the beginnings of the ever-growing, always evolving, and infinitely confusing waters that make up the DC Universe continuity. Navigating our way through the DC's Golden Age, the Silver Age, and culminating in the exploration of the multiverse. Join us as my big fat pull list tries Understanding DC Comics, Part 1, Crisis of Continuity. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode of my big fat pull list. I am one of your hosts, Mr. X, across the table from me tonight is... Oddly enough, not Smurfy, Pistol Danger. That's right. Smurfy is on assignment in New York, wasting time. <laughs> that's that's about... Yeah, that's right. 100%. Yeah. And we also have... Dr. Impact. Dr. Impact, it is very important that you are here for this episode because we are delving into trying to understand... DC Comics and the continuity that it's had over the last 80 years. So I'm I'm a little worried if we should even start this because you guys brought me on to the show specifically to deal with DC and yes. the DC history. So if we start this and then we go through everything and by the end of the season if we have finished the the thing are you just going to kick me off the show? Yes. Is that it? I'm done. Yes, I think well, that well, well that, let's not get hasty. <laughs> oh, we're going to lie to him right now? <laughs> no. Oh, thanks. Yeah. See how I handle that? It's called diplomacy. And there's so much continuity, it'll probably take at least another volume or two to get through everything. Hmm, wink? (laughs) Plus, there are ongoing DC books that uh, neither of us are reading. That's true. uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm only reading Old Man Batman and Gotham City Monsters, so there's a wide range for you to keep talking about DC for us. Yeah, yeah. And other things. Speaking of other things, let's talk about something very important. Our Patreon page. For our third volume, we decided we were going to do exactly what everybody else has done and start up a Patreon page. We want to take just a few minutes right now to let everybody know a few of the incentives that we offer. We are offering really cool swag. We've got magnets. We've got buttons. We've got t-shirts, all of which brandish the the new logo. The If you've noticed, if you've been listening to the show for the last couple of seasons, our logos and, uh, and, and imagery that we've put up on the website and, and throughout all of our platforms has been changed and updated. And yes. so, so it's almost like we're a whole new, you know, we're taking that next reboot step up like, a, like any other comic would. All like new, all but new, not all, all that different. Yeah. S- same level of quality, <laughs> different logo. Oh, you're just going to give them that low pitch, huh? If, if everybody's expectations of the show are low, then they will be pleasantly surprised when we wow them with the information that we give them. That's just a little bit higher than low. Yes. But not, not quite so low. Medium, though. Not quite medium. Not- We're not there yet. Mm-hmm. We would greatly appreciate it if you gave our Patreon page a look. There's a great video that explains exactly what we're doing what we're asking of you, and what we're willing to give you as well. So there will be a link to the Patreon page in the show notes for this episode over on our website. 
And if you don't want to go there, just go to www.patreon.com slash mybigfatpolist. Forward slash. Forward slash. I really want one of those t-shirts. What do you guys want? I want to be able to pick a topic for an episode. Yeah, that's never happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't have Smurfy here as backup. Well, now that that's out of the way, we should probably get into uh, into this breakdown sooner rather than later because this is there is a lot of information yeah. uh, okay. to go through on this. 80 years. 80 years. But And, and keep in mind, for those of you who, who were not able to glean this from either – the intro or the title of the episode we're not covering all 80 years in this episode there's no way we're only going up to the early 80s only oh (laughs) only yeah um so obviously we're gonna we're gonna skip a lot (laughs) to get up to that point but it's all everything that we're covering is stuff that i feel is probably the most important stuff to cover in order for people to follow dc comics today now, as someone who's an outsider but still listen to every episode of The Mighty Crusaders, how is this going to differ from that? I'm glad you asked that, Pistol. It's on the notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it will differ from how we structured The Mighty Crusaders episodes in the sense that The Mighty Crusaders podcast miniseries event that we did just prior to this season starting check the archives check the archives check it out we'll put links in the show notes for all five of those episodes if you haven't listened to them yet but it it will differ because those episodes broke down the entire publishing history of the characters it wasn't just it wasn't just about the comics or the continuity it was about the publishers that had them the legal battles throughout where the world was, what inspired them, how they influenced comics, things of that nature. It was very much more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. We ain't doing that here. We ain't doing that here. (laughs) There there will be a little bit of that here in this first episode because of the nature of how the multiverse comes about in Mm -hmm. DC, which we'll get into. But uh, for the most part, this is really going to be more story time, in a sense. This is really going to be more of just breaking down the continuity as it happened in comics, so that, in theory, if you've listened to all of our DC history podcasts, starting here and with the ones coming up that, you know, going forward, then you should theoretically then be able to jump into a current DC comic and be able to at least follow what's going on. You may not know all the finer details, you may not know all the finer characters, but when they start talking about various reboots and multiverses, hopefully you wouldn't be completely lost. Unless you're completely lost by the end of this episode (laughs) because of all of the multiverses and everything, which is entirely possible. And that's going to come up a lot more often than you think. DC was one of the premier multiverse comic books. Yeah, I believe that they, I would assume anyway, that they were probably the first comic book company to introduce the concept of multiverses in parallel worlds. Well, And Um, really it came about as more of a boy, we got to clean this up because things are really confusing. Yes, sort of. But interestingly, as we will discover in this episode, it actually started before most people think it does. Ooh, well then, let's jump right in. Let's get to Understanding the DC Comics. Part one, Crisis of Continuity. The Superman Cometh. To begin, yes, Mm -hmm. I know that we said that we wouldn't really go into a whole lot of the publication stuff, but we do have to touch on a few little things here and there in this first segment. Right, here in the beginning. Here in the beginning, we do have to hit a few things. I think it is important to note that in the 30s, Mm -hmm. most comics at that time were reprints of Sunday newspaper strips, Mm, comic strips. Okay, yep. From what I have read over the years and from from what I have found doing research for this episode, I, nothing contradicted this, this info. So I assume that it's still widely held belief that New Fun Comics number one mm-hmm. is the very first all original comic book hmm, that okay. is published. I want to say it's somewhere around... 1936-ish, wow. somewhere in that area. And that was... And that was published by a company called National Publishing. National Publishing, as most people probably know, eventually became DC Comics. Right. 
DC has the distinction of having the first original, all original material book in New Fun Comics number one. Now, I think that most people consider the DC universe to start, I think, in New Fun number six. And I'm not sure exactly why. I'm not sure why the first five don't really count or what is in issue six that causes it to start there. But that's, I think, where most people consider DC's Golden Age begins. Mm, Okay. But the first real noticeable thing that we get is Detective Comics number one. It's a detective comic. Well, (laughs) the characters are detectives. (laughs) I would have never guessed. So our first major DC character is a detective by the name of Slam Bradley. He may show up from time to time over the 80 years. Uh, He may have been reused here and there. I don't know that he's all that important, other than the fact that he is the lead in Detective Comics number one. I feel like it's just a piece of tidbit trivia that is important for all comic fans to know. Slam Bradley. Slam Bradley. Man, why wasn't that my wrestler name? Yeah, good. Yeah, really, yeah. Damn it. That's a good 1930s detective name for you. Yeah. It's very typical. But things kick off. I mean, everybody knows when it really kicks off. Action Comics number one. Well, yeah. Introduction to Superman. Introduction of Superman. We wouldn't have called this segment the Superman Cometh if it wasn't. So what happens here is we get essentially our very first superpowered hero in Superman. We're not going to go over Superman's story. Everybody pretty much knows Superman's story. However, what I will mention is that Superman in Action Comics number one, and this is important to note, arrives on Earth as an infant, but does not begin his superhero career until he's an adult. He never becomes Superboy. There is no Superman traveling. The way he's just He becomes an adult, and he is Superman. Right. Okay. And there you go. Uh, and right from the get-go, you know, he's he's violent. I mean, he'll drop people off buildings, and he'll put his fist through cars and grab people and pull them through glass windows. And, you know, it's 1938, 1939 at this point. It's a very different style of living. There's, you know, sensors aren't quite as... Sensory? Yes. It's a great way to put it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the movies at that time, the sensor board hasn't really even fully taken over. I mean, they've they've been established and they are working. But up until this point, even movies had nudity and some pretty graphic violence that occurred in them. Uh, So why would comics be any different? Yeah. And they weren't made just for kids. Sure, kids read them. But comics at that time, you're you're talking going from the Depression into the, the start of the war, most of them were yeah, there. That's your propaganda inter- for us. It's yeah, it's your entertainment and propaganda, right? For adults, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's it's a very different world. And when Detective Comics twenty seven hits, Batman follows suit, pretty much the same way. So all of that is pretty much basic. I, I do think it's important to note that there is a character that predates Batman by seven issues, who is similar to Batman in the sense that he has no real abilities, but he's he's a vast crime fighter, essentially, and that is the Crimson Avenger. Again, another character who comes up here and there throughout time in DC, but doesn't really have a huge impact. Like Slam Bradley. Like Slam Bradley. No (laughs) one really remembers the Crimson Avenger. The Crimson Avenger. What a mistake. (laughs) What a mistake. From there, we start introducing other heroes at National, at National DC Comics. There's really no continuity. So it's just stories. It's just stories. Mm-hmm. So trying to dissect continuity of DC Comics at this point, there really isn't any. Yeah, in the Golden Age, it's just mostly, hey, here's another adventure. That's right. Hey, yeah. those characters worked. Let's introduce uh, this guy wearing a gas mask. That's the Sandman. Okay. Okay, great. go he's, with it. Go he's with also it. got a gun. Here's a, a guy that gets hit with some weird fumes and... He can run really fast now, and uh, you know, and he wears a little gold helmet like the god Mercury or Hermes or whichever god that is. Whichever, that, whichever one you want to, <laughs> whichever one you want to go with, Roman or Greek, depending you know, on so, what, what what you're feeling. Right. So you know, you got Jay Garrick, the Flash. You know, so I mean, they're just introducing characters. There's nothing big. You know, you get uh, the original Carter Hall Hawkman mm-hmm. here, uh, who I I want to say was an archaeologist uh, at, at that time, if I remember correctly. Johnny, so, so so that that part of his convoluted origin dates all the way oh, back that goes to all the, the way back to the golden age. age. Okay, yes. Carter, interesting. Carter Hall, right, is an archaeologist. Yes. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, I also learned that Green Arrow, at this time, 
was also a scientist and archaeologist millionaire. <laughs> what, what? Yes. Okay. Who, who I, I forget why, but he has to go to some bizarre island because there's some sort of business dealings that have gone bad, and he has to go to the island. And while on the this is this is his origin. This is how okay. he starts. <laughs> So when he when he gets to this island, he finds that there is a young boy who has been shipwrecked on the island and teaching himself how to hunt and be an archer by the name of Roy Harper. Oh, wow. So in the original Golden Age, and I've never read a Golden Age Green Arrow book, so this is all news to me as well. But in the original Golden Age Green Arrow, it's it's Roy who is shipwrecked on the island. Not not Oliver. Oliver just goes there, meets up with them, the two team up, and become Green Arrow and Oh, Speedy. look, I found a boy. I found and a boy. I will keep Let him. Take him. And he will teach me how to be <laughs> badass. Uh, yeah. I just imagine Roy being like, can I see my parents? No, not no. for another adventure or so. <laughs> Stay with me, boy. You know, there's others. You know, Johnny Thunder and his, and his genie. Um, oh yeah, his genie yeah. say you. I think is is how you pronounce that. Go on. Yeah, yeah. I don't know much more about him. That I just a, know that you say JSA say stuff. you. Yeah, yeah, that's some JSA stuff. Well, the JSA. There's another one, which is the first time that we start to bring all of these characters together. Mm. Uh, and that JSA, you know, that will also include our man and the Al Pratt version of the Atom, who I believe is really just a wrestler, essentially. Same thing like the Wildcat of that era, the Ted Grant Wildcat. Yeah, because he was just he was essentially he was just, just a, a boxer. boxer. He was yeah. just a boxer who put on um, a cat costume. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, the the biggest outside of Superman and I guess Flash and Spectre, the only other major superhero at this time is the Alan Scott Green Lantern, the original Green Lantern, who uh, I guess he finds a magic lantern after a, a train accident. That he grabs onto, and then it allows him to survive the accident, mm. and then he fashions a ring that he can use off of it. Um, again, this is you know ten, fifteen years before Hal Jordan arrives. Right. Does he still have to charge the ring through the lantern? You or? know that I don't know. It's okay. a good question. If anybody it knows, was, I mean, it's yeah, a small semantics yeah. question. Yeah, it was. It was more mystical. It was than very much magic space based. age, yes. and okay. and the kryptonite. The I was just going to say field, it. Yep, go for it. Is wood. I did know that. Yes. Because I always wondered if he had to go through a forest, if he was just absolutely up Shit's <laughs> Creek or not. Well, it reminds me of a, a Doctor Who joke when David Tennant was the Doctor. He's like, you know, he's, he's using the sonic screwdriver, but th it's a wooden door. He's like, it's sonic. It's not going to open wood. It's wood. It's a wooden door. <laughs> so uh, so anytime door. I ever I, I, I see an episode where, where you know, I'm sorry, I can't use a sonic screwdriver. It's wood. I always think... Oh, you must know Alan Scott. I was going to say, maybe that's where the lantern comes from. Maybe. maybe from the Time Lords. Yeah. I don't know. And is there like a size or just like if he just fell into a pile of wood chips, is he just, is he just unable to use his... <laughs> Who like, knows? Like, my God, so many like Maybe weird... it's like one of the, the weird kryptonites where if you fall into too much wood, maybe you turn evil or something. Yeah. Or I don't know. I feel like I just defeat him by like picking up a branch off the ground. I'm like, no. Yeah, <laughs> just knack him on the nose. Yeah, stop. <laughs> oh, no, it's teak. <laughs> We're having way too much fun we making are. fun of right. Golden Age Alan Scott. Yes, we are. We are. There are plenty of other characters from the Golden Age that can be made fun of. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the bigger characters that you probably know from general DC continuity come from this era. Black Canary mm. comes from the original Golden Age JSA era. Starman comes from that era. Robin, of course, premieres at this time right. in this era as, as the sidekick and spawns everyone having a sidekick as a result. Aquaman. Well, technically, wouldn't Green Arrow have spawned the idea of the sidekicks? With well, no, no, that, that actually occurs after Robin premieres. Okay. Robin does premiere before Green Arrow and Speedy. Okay, yeah, Robin so, is yeah. officially the first ever yeah. teen sidekick yeah. For in, in a comic book. Or just in, just, comic, just in comic books. Okay, in comic okay books. you're right. Yeah, yes, comics. yes. Uh, Aquaman, I found out, interestingly enough, was not Atlantean in the Golden Age, hmm. uh, which I did not know. I, I just discovered that Aquaman at this time was, his father basically is a, a marine biologist and scientist as well, and discovers the lost city of Atlantis after a woman that he has fallen in love with, that he's met, his wife has passed on. She now passes, and so I guess he goes to Atlantis and creates a like an air bubble home in Atlantis and figures out a way to live underwater and study 
the books and tomes in Atlantis and teaches his son what he learns. And the people are so, just cool with this? Uh, evidently. Like, here's this, this evidently. rabble route. Okay. I guess. Like, so, a guy in a trailer just pulling up to your house and be like... Just saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to live in your backyard. Yeah. I'm going to read your books. Yeah, we, um, let, we let one human down here. There's going to be a shanty town of humans. That's right. On the outskirts yeah. of Atlantis. So, yeah, Arthur's not Atlantean. He's just a freeloader, essentially. <laughs> well, how does he have just, power? How is he Aquaman? He, he learned the tips and tricks, I guess, of the Atlanteans, I assume, from what wow. I've heard. <laughs> from what I've read, anyway. I saw him look at a fish weird, and I looked at the fish <laughs> yeah. weird, and I can talk to him. I, and I can talk, yeah. yeah it's great. The um, golden age the is golden ridiculous. The golden age of Why comics. is it called the golden age again? Because it's... Because <laughs> look at all the golden. characters it gave us. Yes. But... All of that gets turned upside down when we have our first major female hero that appears in comics. In All Star Comics number eight, we get Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman, it's your you know your your very basic a story where she's you know from Themyscira and she comes to man's world and and pretty much what we know of now as the basic origin is is essentially what is there at the beginning. First character that actually has any kind of real connection to mythology. Most characters are based loosely based off of yes. that's true of the uh, the archetypes that's true. from mythology, but Wonder Woman actually has roots in in actual yes, mythology in right. mythology as opposed to like the Flash who just kind of has the hat. has the connection yeah again. yeah so yeah so that's basically what you start with that's everything and of course at this time there's also a lot of major villains that we know today that date back to this era. Uh, some of the big ones are Lex Luthor, mm. Joker. Uh, obviously, those are the two big ones. Right. Mm-hmm. But you also get Penguin, Catwoman, and Two Face early on. Oh, really? Two Face okay. goes back that far. Okay. This one shocked me. I did not know that the Basil Carlo Clayface goes really? all the way back to the Golden Age. To the age. Golden Age. Not just goes all the way back to the Golden Age, but outside of Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, and Two Face, pretty much predates any other Bat villains. Wow. The, or any of the other major ones, anyway. Wow. From what I've, I've discovered. That kind of blew me away. Ares, of course, with Wonder Woman, shows up at this time. Although I, find, I found out that in his second appearance, he no longer goes by the name Ares. He's now going by the name Mars. Ah. So now I don't know if that continues on through the Golden Age and changes again later or what. But he does go back to that era. Hmm. Solomon Grundy, I did not know, went back to the Golden Age. Oh, the Golden Age. Wow, era. okay. Mr. McSplitalik. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correct. Mr. McSplitalik. McSplitalik. Yeah. I think we all say that. I know we're all mixed uh, yeah, Who knows yeah. how to actually yeah. say it? Except for him. There was also a character from that era known as the Harlequin, if that oh. rings any bells. Now, her name was, her, her name was actually Molly Maine Harlequin, not Harley Quinn. Right. So it doesn't really have anything to do. But I, I found that interesting that the idea of a character like that kind of goes back Good to... Good guy, bad guy. Oh, a villain. villain. Villain, but I don't think had any connection to Joker. Right. Or Batman anything villain? Like that. I don't recall. Okay. I don't recall. Hmm. Vandal Savage goes back there. Scarecrow goes back there. There was an, an interesting character that I did not know existed. Star Sapphire actually goes back... To the Golden to Age? To the Golden Age. Wow. It is obviously not Carol Ferris. R- well, right. It obviously has no connection to a sapphire core of any kind or anything like that. She is a queen of another world who hmm. uh, comes and invades this world. And I forget who... Uh, I forget whose book she shows up in and whose primary villain she is. But, hmm. Uh, hmm. yeah, I thought that was interesting. The Injustice Society, of course, premieres. The the biggest character I think here to mention uh, as far as lesser known villains, and we don't have to go into detail on him necessarily at this time, is the Psycho Pirate. Hmm. Um, now the Psycho Pirate at this point in time is Charles Halstead, and he does date back to the 40s. Basically, he's just a crook who operates by trying to affect people's emotions through his crimes. And I guess he kind of ups his game every now and then. That's really all that it needs to be known about him right. at this point in time. And I bring him up because the name Psycho Pirate becomes so incredibly important to DC continuity down the line. Right, yes. right. So there you have the beginning of DC, the Golden Age. However, again, going into the publication end of everything, there were other comic companies at the time. There was a company called 
quality comics publishing in the 30s and 40s. And of course, like anybody else, they had their own pantheon of superheroes. Characters like Uncle Sam, Plastic Man, the Phantom Lady, the okay. Human Bomb, Black Condor, the Black Hawk, the original Firebrand. The characters who later in the 70s and 80s ended up being known more as the Freedom Fighters. Okay. But they were originally published by Quality Comics, and it all started with Uncle Sam in National Comics Number 1. At the same time, Wiz Comics started from <laughs> Fawcett Press. <laughs> yeah, isn't that a name for a comic? Wiz Comics. And that gave us Captain Marvel, who we know now as Shazam. Ah, oh, yes. And the, and the entire Marvel family and their villains, Black Adam and Mr. Mind <laughs> and the Monster Society and, and you know, and all that, that stuff. That crocodile. So we, we get all of that from, from Fawcett and, and Wiz Comics. It, it's around this time that DC determines that Fawcett has basically infringed on Superman with Captain Marvel. Hmm. Huh. And they sue, saying, you know, this character is, is far too similar to Superman. So that gets stuck in a long legal battle for quite a while into the 40s. And eventually it just kind of, they, they decide to just kind of cancel everything. And, right. And Fawcett goes away. I bring all of those up, all of these other publishers up, because after the Silver Age begins, when we get into that stuff, those companies were bought by DC Comics. And DC Comics at that time then owned them. But I am getting a little ahead of myself. So as of right now, they are individual publishers, and they're all from the Golden Age. They are all from the 30s and 40s era. Hmm. When does the name change from National Publication Alliance Go to DC. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, again, because I was mostly focusing more on the okay. continuity, except where different companies were bought out. Okay. But if anybody does know the answer to that, by all means, be sure to head over to our website or on social media and, and fill us in. Let us know. So all of this kind of comes to a head with something that we seem to bring up every two or three episodes on this show lately. And we really probably should do a full episode on it. We will. The, the it'll, sed- it'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. Eventually. The Seduction of the Innocent. Dr. Frederick Wortham's tirade against comics, which kind of ended comic book publishing for just about everything except for the major titles. And most of those being DC titles. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. I think some of Green Arrow and Aquaman survived. And that might be about it. Right. So that kind of takes us up into the early 50s, essentially, when that occurs. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the end of the golden age of comics and DC Comics continuity. And that's where we ask all of you, are any of you fans of the classic original golden age comics from DC? Is there anything that you miss from those early comics that you wish was brought back or reintegrated today head on over to our website at mybigfatpollist.com and let us know the dawn of the silver age now most people consider the beginning of the silver age to be showcase comics number four which is the first appearance of the barry allen flash at this time comics had kind of as i said dwindled because of the seduction of the innocent And Julius Schwartz had been put in charge at DC. His idea was to revive the superhero books. Right. What they did was they essentially just took the name of an old character and the basic power set and created a whole new character around it, Mm. scratching everything that had come before. And at that time, people probably didn't hold on to a lot of old stuff, which is why all of those Golden Age books are so damn rare now. So there weren't really a whole lot of people that would remember the Jay Garrick Flash. Yeah. Unless you had an older brother who was eight, nine, ten years older than you, and he had old copies laying around. And they didn't get tossed and they in didn't a burn get, pile. Right, or used in the walls for insulation or thrown into recycling during the war. Right. Then, then chances are you didn't even know who he was. So when you went and picked up Showcase Number Four, this is a brand new thing. You know, this is this is all new, and that's where you get your classic Barry Allen scientist hit with the 
the lightning bolt and bathed in chemicals and becomes the Flash. That was such a success. It took off so much that Julia Schwartz decided to follow suit with other classic DC characters. It's at that point that we get the Ray Palmer Adam. Okay. Who now can shrink. He's no longer just the the guy with the little face mask and the cape from the 40s. He's now can alter his size long before Ant-Man comes along. Aquaman now has been reworked as the half-human, half-Atlantean child. Right. And that's where, where this kind of comes into play. Green Arrow, it is sometime during here where Green Arrow switches over to becoming the millionaire playboy shipwrecked on the island who teaches himself how to, to become the Green Arrow. Because he doesn't have a boy to do it. Because he doesn't have a boy it. to do it for him. <laughs> the biggest, of course, the biggest one of the bunch, though, is the Green Lantern. Yeah. That's the one that seems to, much the way Superman and Batman affected the entire golden age of comics and everything that has come after them, Barry Allen Flash and Hal Jordan Green Lantern are those fill-ins for, the for this Silver era. Age. Yeah, Very definitely. much so. Okay. This is where we get the introduction of the Guardians on Oa. And Which were originally called the Guardians of the Universe. The Guardians of the Universe. But it was a hell of a yes. lot easier just to call them the, the Guardians. Guardians. Yes. Are they still little and blue and wear red robes? From what I understand, yeah, I think they started off that way. Yeah, okay. I think it was always like that. And then you get a whole bunch of new heroes throughout the Silver Age. A brand new science-based heroes. Because it's the Atomic Age. You know, where we're looking at giant radioactive mutated monsters on the big screen. And... and Science experiments gone wrong and creating teenage werewolves and what have you in, in movies. So, right. so now we get the challengers of the unknown who run around and investigate, basically like the Fantastic Four did. They investigate fantastic things in the universe. They go into the unknown. They go into the unknown and it's challenging. Yes. They, they learn it. <laughs> One of the earliest things, I didn't realize that these guys went back this far, is the Legion of Superheroes. Oh, so Silver Age. They, the Legion of Superheroes go all the way back. Because at this time, Superboy has been established. We have had about seven or eight years. Superboy comes in at the tail end of the Golden Age. And now we're saying that Superman was Superboy before he moved to Metropolis. So the continuity is already starting to get really messed up yeah. and really confusing. Not to mention the fact that up to this point, we've had a number of what DC at the time would call imaginary stories, okay. which are basically what-ifs. We have a very extensive episode that covers Elseworlds and what-ifs and the original DC imaginary stories. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well, so you can check that episode out, and then you can get all details on all the various different alternate worlds that, that were shown at that time. And welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us here. We're Jump On Point, but we are, yes. we're happy to have you. It's an all new, it's yeah. all new, you know, all new, all not, new so different. not so different. <laughs> <laughs> we also at this time get uh, something that I know Pistol is very much into, at least he's into the TV show. We get the Doom Patrol. Yes. At this time. We get the Elongated Man. We get Kid Flash this early on. Wow. Yeah, Kid Flash comes in very early. Uh, Kid Flash is probably outside of outside of Speedy and Robin. He's probably the next Teen Titan that that emerges mm, okay. in comics. But then you know you get Wonder Girl, and of course you do get the Teen Titans, and you get the Justice League, and Supergirl is brought in, and so now suddenly Superman is no longer the last son. Uh, there is now he is. Well, he's well still I guess the he's technically the last son. son. He's not the last survivor. Yes, I guess. right. Yeah, right. We get characters like Metamorpho. Zatanna, Animal Man, Batgirl. These guys all come from the first two or three years of the 60s. What about the Martian Age. Manhunter? Well, I held off mentioning Martian Manhunter because Martian Manhunter, there's some conflictions with where he fits. Oh. Martian Manhunter appeared first in Detective Comics. Okay. Technically, it was before Showcase Number 4. Oh. But only by a little bit. So most people consider Showcase Number 4 to be the beginning of the Silver Age. Martian Manhunter was never a part of the Golden Age, even though his first appearance is published before what is considered the beginning of the Silver Age. Okay. So there are some historians who believe that 
that that is actually the start of the Silver Age. It, I guess it depends on how you want to look at it and, and which way you kind of want to go. Because the Martian Manhunter that shows up isn't quite the Martian Manhunter that we know now. And isn't quite the Martian Manhunter that even joins the Justice League a couple of years later. He's just a little different, a little tweaked. Almost like how when you see in Marvel Comics, before the Fantastic Four, they had like Tales to Astonish and Tales of Suspense. And there was an issue with the tree monster Groot. Okay. okay. Well, right. that's not really the Groot that we know now. That's not really the superhero Groot. So yeah. somebody but was that called is his Martian first Manhunter. Groot. Yeah. Yes. And we like the name. So and he was he we'll, looked like Martian Manhunter, we'll, but he we'll, just we'll wasn't. We'll tweak him later on yeah. down the line. Yeah. Well, same thing. DC did the same thing with Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing appeared. Yes. In yes. A, in, in fact, a, in that's probably of, even a better comparison. Right. In an issue of House of Secrets. Swamp and that's thing. very okay. similar with Martian Manhunter. And so that's why I kind of held off uh, mentioning him till till last I, I do want to also mention, too, at this time that there is another group of superheroes, and I lose, use that term loosely because they're not really super, but there is another group that appears at this time known as the Suicide Squad. Uh-huh. Now, this is not Deadshot and Amanda Waller and the Task Force X that we know today. This is not that Suicide Squad. Okay. okay. They are in DC continuity, they are canon, and it is Rick Flagg running them. Oh, okay. But they're more like... The Challengers of the Unknown, or like Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, or Sergeant Rock and his crew and Fighting Company and, and those kinds of things. Now, they're not necessarily war soldiers, but they are spies and soldiers and, and trained officials of various types who go on missions that are likely suicidal. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. And so that is where the Suicide Squad kind of starts. And it is Rick Flagg, but that that's not really the Suicide Squad as we know them now. You know, it's also at this time that we get some of the best villains. You know, outside of the, the Batman rogues gallery, Captain Cold shows up during this era, of course. Ah, Captain Cold. Yes. Reverse Flash. All the great Flash villains, obviously. Mm-hmm. You know, we get all of them. We get the Carol Ferris Star Sapphire. Okay. During this, okay. Bizarro, Brainiac, Gorilla Grodd shows up for you, Gorilla Monkey fans. Metallo, Amazo. Again, all of them are science based. It's a very heavily science influenced era in DC. But what is also starting to happen now is that they are starting to connect them much faster than the JSA did back in the Golden Age. Right. Okay. So they're all starting to connect, and they are starting to build a continuity. And this starts with Green Lantern issue two, actually. Oh, wow. So in Green Lantern issue two, Green Lantern actually gets called away to save another world from a group of people known as the Weaponers of Quard. Okay, and this is Hal Jordan Green Lantern. This is Hal Jordan Green Lantern. This is Silver Age. This is issue two of Hal Jordan Green Lantern. He gets pulled away to save people from the Weaponers of Quard. Now, to get there, he has to go into the antimatter universe. So in Green Lantern number two, we establish that there is an antimatter universe. That's about all that they really do, and I don't even know if they really necessarily go into too much detail about it. It just but sounds it's, cool. It sounds cool, and it's there, and it starts. Okay. Ironically, about three or four years prior to this, in Wonder Woman number 59, Wonder Woman gets sucked away to a alternate Earth where she has to help a woman by the name of Tara Taruna save her people. Now, Tara Taruna, in this Earth, <laughs> in this world, means... Wonder Woman. Oh. We have our first doppelganger actually in Wonder Woman 59. It is not set up as an official multiverse world. It's not technically part of anything where the DC multiverse really is concerned, but it starts it. And then Green Lantern number two with the Weaponers of Quard kind of takes us up to the next level. That's where kind of a lot of those ideas began. Again, switching back over to the publication end of, of things, much like it was in the 
in the 40s and 30s, there were other comic companies, and there was a company known as Charlton Comics. Ah, yes. Which is very famous to most people for its influence on Watchmen. But Charlton, you know, that's Blue Beetle and Captain Atom and The Question, and they are a whole separate comic book line. And, uh, and their Blue Beetle, actually, Blue Beetle goes back to the 30s and 40s himself, but that's Dan Garrett, Blue Beetle, and I forget who published them. Mm. And I want to say that those might even be public domain, those, those early Dan Garrett Blue Beetles. This is Ted Cord Blue Beetle. This is the Blue Beetle that anybody from the age of maybe 25 to 55 probably grew up with. Okay. Right, yeah. Tech-based beetle. Tech-based blue beetle, yes. He had the scarab, but it never did anything for him. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. It was just part of the outfit. And that was Charlton Comics that did all of that. Yeah. He was Uh, essentially Batman, only more science-y. Yeah, Yeah. and a little lighter. Yeah. Yeah, So not, Not so brooding. No, no. And of course, you know, like quality comics, like Fawcett, Charlton is, of course, bought up by DC in about 10 years after this. So that's why I mention them, because they will come into play. But that's kind of it. That's that's where the Silver Age starts. And we start to like pull these characters together. We start to have the Teen Titans. We start to have the Justice League. We start to have this coherent universe. Hmm. Keep in mind that at this time, there's a, a guy who is doing books about a Spider-Man and a Hulk and for fantastic people and he's blowing the competition away with a very tight continuity or at least very tight for that time. for that time yeah you know dc had to step up they had to match marvel so they had to start creating continuity well it got very confusing because as we said there were all of these imaginary stories there's now this weird tara taruna wonder woman thing this weaponer of cord world things aren't making sense and i guess there were enough people that remembered the golden age because the silver age gave way to probably the single most defining thing in dc comics history we want to know which you thought was better the golden age or the silver age of comics head on over to our social media accounts and tell us which one was your favorite and why The multiverse is discovered. How do we fix up this confusing mess that we started? Well, for whatever reason, their best idea was, let's not. (laughs) Let's just not clean it up. Fair enough. (laughs) Let it ride. Instead, let's make it worse. (laughs) Let's bring back one of those classic characters. With Flash 123, the Flash Barry Allen transports from Central City to an alternate Earth, to a city known as Keystone City, which is where Jay Garrick, the Flash from the Golden Age, resides. This is, regardless of the Wonder Woman book, regardless of the Green Lantern issue 2, this is the actual beginning of the multiverse. Okay. This is where it starts. The very famous Flash of Two Worlds. All right. One of the most famous, if not maybe the most famous Flash comic, maybe ever. So basically what we, what we discover here now is that Barry Allen took his name based on the comic books that he read as a kid. The Flash comics. So all of the 40s Golden Age stuff for the Justice League characters, all of those were comic books that they read about. Right. But those were all real things that happened. On this alternate Earth. Okay. Which was designated as Earth 2. I don't know why they got saddled with Earth 2 and why the other ones are Earth 1. I don't know what the. I mean, when you, when you, know, you go somewhere. But I guess you if claim, you. Yeah, you yeah, claim. Yeah, you discover it. Yeah, right. I found Earth 2. Well, wait a minute. We were here first. 2. 2. It doesn't two. matter. I called it first. Fine. You can be Earth B. I have a flag. <laughs> don't oh, you don't, see my flag? Don't worry about Earth B. Uh. We'll get there in a minute. <laughs> But, but, yeah, so, you know, everything that, that is read about all of those, those old characters, they are just comic book stories on Earth-1, but on Earth-2, it's all real. So now we are establishing here that anything that happened in DC Comics, starting with New Fun Comics number 6 and going up until right before, well, I guess that would be, what, Showcase number 3, Yeah. anything during that era took place... On Earth 2. So now that will now at least explain well, 
that Superman on Earth 2 did start his life as an adult, whereas the Superman on Earth 1 was Superboy. Did he, meet he the got Legion. powers early on? Right. So went to the future and was a legionnaire. That was and... kind of their loose way of fixing it, but in doing so, yeah. they just created more problems for the whole thing because it gets so convoluted. Those early multiverse stories are great. Flash one thirty seven is the first return of the JSA. It's a story called "The Vengeance of the Immortal Villain," and in it. I, I want to say that the JSA is, I think, kidnapped, I believe, or, or they're having some issue with Vandal Savage on Earth 2. Because he's the immortal villain. Because he's the immortal villain. villain. Mm-hmm. And he's a Golden Age character, so he's Earth 2. So I think Jay goes to Earth 1 because he needs Barry's help to get him out. He's the only other person that he can get to. And then they go over and they, you know, that's our first introduction to the JSA as being actual characters. So now on Earth 2, Barry meets up with... Carter Hall Hawkman. Well, the Hawkman that he knows on Earth-1 is the Thanagarian police officer, Katar Hall. Right. Spelled with a K. Carter spelled, obviously, with a C. But there's, with the exception of Flash and Green Lantern, there really aren't a whole lot of defining moments as to where these changes take place. Hawkman keeps getting printed. Maybe he's missing for a year or two after the seduction of the innocent shuts things down. Suddenly DC starts publishing Hawkman comics again. It's no different than the Hawkman before. But then somewhere along the line, suddenly now he's an alien officer, and there's no real clear delineation. I think historians have since gone back and tried to pinpoint exact issues for Hawkman, Superman, and Batman as to what their Silver Age first appearance is. We don't have that information. I didn't dig into all of that because I was mainly focused on the story. But that's not what this podcast that's not what this is, is about. about. You think you're going to learn something here, you nerd? Wrong. That's right. Well, Do you're your going to learn research. something, but you're not going to learn the thing that you think you're going to learn. <laughs> you're going to learn what we want you to learn, and you're going to like it the whole time. Yeah, see? <laughs> Slam Bradley, see? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, so things kick up with Justice League number 21. When Justice League of America number 21 comes out, the headline on the front of the book is The Crisis on Earth-1. And this is where everything starts to heat up. The Crisis of Earth-1, we finally get the first pairing between the Justice League of America and the Justice Society of America. Okay, because it's a crisis on Earth-1, so it's the Justice League's yes. crisis. It is the Justice League's crisis. Yes. Something else I, I found to be interesting about this that I I don't think I really understood or didn't really know, I guess, is that the Black Canary was never really rebooted in the Silver Age. Hmm. Now, I guess she, she does come into the Silver Age eventually, but not, not at first. At first, the Black Canary that you've got is Earth 2. Huh. That's really interesting. Weird. Yeah, okay. which I found it. So, so I, I, that was kind of a, a shocker to me. That's followed up by the very next issue of the Justice League, Justice League of America number 22, which is Crisis on Earth 2. Ah, well, <laughs> didn't so, even wait. No, no. They, we, you know, you come over to our you, house, right. we'll come over to your house. We helped you with your problem, now you got to help <laughs> yeah, us with ours. Yeah. Well, they, and they actually do kind of connect. I mean, it's, it's one of the earliest cases of a storyline that is not self-contained in one issue. Okay. Even though... Issue 21 does kind of have an ending. It's still enough of a cliffhanger that it propels you into Crisis on Earth 2. Okay. That was immensely popular. The sales on those two books were huge. So big that it became an annual thing. Every year, for about 12 or 15 years, Earth 1 and Earth 2 would cross over for an issue or two. It was an annual event. The very next crossover they had after the crisis on Earth 2, however, was Justice League of America 29, which was the crisis on Earth 3. Oh, well, uh, we get a new Earth. We get a new Earth. And this is the first time outside of that Wonder Woman issue where we actually designate another Earth, a brand new created from scratch Earth. We are now building a multiverse. Okay. But this isn't tetrahedron woman's Earth? No, no. Tet- <laughs> I can't, re- right. I can't repronounce her name, and I'm not bothered to scroll through my notes. Okay. Yes, this is, this is not her Earth. Earth 3 is a backwards Earth. So on Earth 3, Abraham Lincoln 
shot Booth. On Earth 3... Was Booth the president? I don't know. <laughs> the president just <laughs> I guess shoot I, I, I don't know. Bang, gotcha, guy. Um, on Earth 3, the American, Christopher Columbus, discovered Europe. <laughs> what? Yes. Oh, this is this is Native what, Americans in Europe. <laughs> this is what this is what Earth Three well, was. Not Native Americans, Native Europeans. Native, Native Europeans. Europeans. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my apologies. Yeah. Um, You're still trash, Christopher Columbus. The, You're still the trash. European Allies defeated the United States Army of Evil, I guess, during during World War Two. This this is a, everything is a backwards Earth. Okay. So naturally, your superheroes are super villains. This is the home of the crime syndicate. This is Ultraman instead of Superman. This is Owlman instead of Batman. Um, Superwoman. Superwoman. Instead of yes, Wonder Woman. Yes. Power Ring instead of right. Green Lantern. All of your good guys are bad guys. What was the Flash's name? Oh, I think it's, isn't it Johnny Quick? Yeah. I think. Johnny Quick. I thought it was Johnny Wiz. For, I... Jo- Johnny Wiz. <laughs> I, I, I remember his name was Johnny something, and I couldn't remember the last name. You're, you're, you're putting Johnny Quick with the Wizard with, yeah. from Marvel. Oh, yeah, with Wizard. Uh, yeah, okay. right, yeah. And and the only hero that this earth has is Alexander Luther. Hair or no hair? Uh, you know, I think he had hair. Actually, I think he had it's red the hair. reverse earth. He's got to have hair. No, that's, yeah, true. that's a good point. Yeah, red flowing locks. Yeah, I thought the joke or the clownster or whatever was a was a hero at the point too. Well, eventually they did introduce other heroes, but that not at this okay. time. At this time, it's just the crime syndicate and Luther. Okay. The multiverse is building. The next major event that occurs that changes pretty much everything is Green Lantern issue 40. The headline title on the cover of the book is The Secret Origin of the Guardians. Ooh, so mysterious. So this is the book. You get, you get a team-up between Hal Jordan and Alan Scott in this issue. And you start to get the history of the Guardians and the planet of Oa. But what's more important is that it's at this point, it is in this issue, that the Guardians explain that centuries ago, there was a scientist by the name of Krona. And this is the important part. Krona was obsessed with discovering the beginnings of the universe. Okay. He created this machine that would allow him to look back at the beginning of the universe. Looking through the machine... He was able to see the hand at creation, the hand that started everything. And it is a hand that holds a universe in it, and it creates what we know. But the machine is unstable, and it explodes. And in doing so, the reverberations, I guess, from the explosion ricochet back to that point in time and shatter the universe into a multiverse. Ah. So everybody's got basically this, the same start. It's when this it's guy all, becomes an asshole and ruins it for and everyone. And it diverges everything. Okay. I think eventually there will be an episode where we will get to where I think even that has been re- retconned. But for <laughs> right now, for right now where we're at, that's the important thing. Krona went back in time and essentially caused the multiverse. He was the original Flashpoint. Sort of, yeah, really. In doing so, what that did was it shattered everything and it created a positive universe where all of these multiverse Earths live and an antimatter universe, which only has one. All of that is established in this one book. Wow. Quite a lot. (laughs) Yeah. That is a lot. Do they ever establish why the negaverse, or sorry, the antimatter verse only has one? Or is it just like, yeah, they only got one? I think it had something to do with antimatter and how it worked off of positive matter. Okay. And I, and I want to say that that kind of played into effect when Crisis gets going here in a little bit. There are a few other things that, that kind of start to throw wrenches into the whole multiverse plan. But first, before any of that really starts to go crazy, you remember that Psycho Pirate character? I do. That we talked yep. about. Got a silly face. It's right. Well, on Earth 2, Halstead is in prison. And while he is in prison, his bunkmate, his cellmate, whatever, is a man by the name of Roger Hayden. And Roger Hayden becomes the new psycho pirate. Now, Roger Hayden, being from Earth 2, 
he has this magic mask, this gold mask. And when he puts it on and he looks at you, he can control your emotions. And therefore, he can essentially control you. But the mask does drive him crazy. I mention Psycho Pirate because he is, when we get to our next episode, he is one of the primary players in Crisis. He is so influential to the destruction of the multiverse and the collapsing of the multiverse. But I thought it was important to note that he is essentially a legacy character, and he does come from Earth, too. Okay. In Flash 179, we get another new Earth. Earth Prime. Well, this, that beats Earth 1. Like, oh, yeah, well, we're Earth we're, Prime. We're Earth Prime, Prime. yes. They start, to, they start to... Our flag's bigger. They start uh, to drop off shipping. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Express. <laughs> they start to drop off numbers. They start coming up with... Uh, with different designations. Earth Prime is essentially our Earth, for all intents and purposes. Like our Earth, like the Earth that the three of us inhabit? Yes, or? at first. Okay. At first, that's what they play it off as. Oh, okay. It is the Earth where all of this are comic books. Mm -hmm. They're all okay. comic book stories. Right. Julius Schwartz inhabits that Earth. Flash meets Julius Schwartz. All of that guy's very meta, if you think about it. There are no superheroes on this Earth. Okay. What separates it from our real reality Earth is that other aliens from other multiverse worlds start to go there. And one in particular, I believe, inhabits that world. But he doesn't come from there. And I forget his name. But so Earth Prime is like a vacation destination? I guess it is. Yeah, I guess so. Jeez. I guess so, yeah. Have you ever been to the Dominican Republic? It's gorgeous. <laughs> Or at least it is until we get uh, right up before Crisis starts, when they get their first hero. But we'll get to that in a second. So after that, the other thing that starts to get convoluted is timelines. Time travel and history starts to get messed up. Because we now get introduced in Adventure Comics 373 to the Tornado Twins. Don and Dawn Allen. <laughs> I remember us talking about them. Were you? Yeah, we talked about them previously and how that was such a bad name. Such a such a bad name. Barry Allen, you were a bad father. Well, and they're they're <laughs> his kids yeah. from or so they say from an alternate future, from some future timeline or or his grandkids, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to mess with time travel quite a bit, and I think uh, I think Barry even once or twice has gone back and forth through time with them. Mm. before they eventually kind of vanish and, and the timeline gets changed and, and rewritten. It's around now that one of the craziest things that could ever happen in DC Comics happens. Go on. It is determined that Iris West is actually from the 30th century. Uh, what? <laughs> Excuse me? Yes, I know. This kind of took me by surprise, too, when I found this out. She's evidently, for real, from the 30th century, who, as an infant, like Superman, was sent back in time and was adopted, not by Joe West, like the TV show has as her father, but is adopted by Ira West. And he raises her. And I'm sorry, wait a minute. Yeah. Pause. <laughs> the guy's name is Iro? Ira. So he's Ira I, West I, and names the daughter that he adopts Iris. Iris West. Well, she's yes. going to go on to name Dawn and Dawn, so this whole family <laughs> has shit names. Carry on. Yeah. Well, anyway, so it, it turns out that she is this traveler who is sent back in time. She is the immortal enemy. And immortal she, she has married Barry by this point. She knows that he is the Flash. They are together. And Professor Zoom then kills her he does succeed in killing her so uh, yeah that's a pretty big deviation from what most people <laughs> think of yeah as as iris west meanwhile over in the superman books and superman 257 you have the retirement of green lantern tomar ray see the fish gills is the, the fish be beak yeah okay, right th yeah yeah he's very cool he's always one of my favorites yeah seems like a nice guy he, he's retiring from the core and at his retirement it comes out that he is the reason krypton was destroyed 
Oh. What? That he was tasked with that sector. He was tasked with getting some mineral, and I can't remember what it's called now, that would take care of the core of Krypton and save it. And he got there just as Kal-El's rocket ship is leaving. He, okay. has, he has gotten there too late. So he feels that it is his fault that Krypton was destroyed. I found that to be a very interesting piece of information. Well, it yeah. doesn't really it doesn't really play in a whole lot to the whole multiverse thing in DC history. I just found it very interesting yeah. when I discovered Well, and then it. moving I mean, I, forward after Crisis, it really doesn't come up again. No. Because things change. Right, but right. for this point in time, that's a big deal that, for the that's continuity a huge at that time. Deal. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. What uh, does Superman do? You know, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how he responds. I, I actually, after I read about that, I, it made me want to track the book down yeah. and, and read it because I right. would really like to see how that actually does play out. Yeah, if any of our listeners own the issue or have read it, let us know what Superman's reaction was yeah. to that information. We really want to know. Or just give it to us. In the publication world, in the real world now, right? our world, our world, it's at this point that DC starts buying up old companies and leasing old companies, much like they did years later with the Mighty Crusaders stuff. Yeah. They, they leased the Fawcett characters. So they leased Shazam and all of those characters, and they put them on Earth-S. <laughs> How lazy do you got to yeah. be? In fact, I discovered that DC did not actually purchase the Shazam characters until the 90s. They were on lease until then. Wow. That's a long lease. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas all of the other characters, they did purchase. So the Charlton characters who appear on Earth 4 were purchased <laughs> at this time. Earth the Quality Comics characters were purchased, and they were put on Earth Quality. Oh, come <laughs> on. You're not even trying at this point. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff like that. There were, there were Earths like Earth B and then Earth B2 where Earth-B2 was essentially like Earth-B, but there was like one minute thing that was different. It's at this time that they start going back to the imaginary stories. This is when they start going back to those old imaginary stories and designating each one of them mm -hmm. to a separate uh, Earth. Okay. So instead of an imaginary story, now it's this is a representation right. of that particular right. Earth. In that universe. In our in our episode on Elseworlds and what ifs and imaginary stories, we talked about the story where Superman and Batman grew up as brothers. Yes. yes. Yeah. That is now, and I don't remember what Earth it is, but uh, that is now given its own designation. It's Earth Brothers. It's yeah. Earth Bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that gets introduced at this time is Earth X. Oh. The Nazi Earth. The Nazi Earth. Now what I found I, I learned about that from yeah. watching the shows. <laughs> what I found interesting about Earth X in the comics is that the Earth quality characters, Uncle Sam, Phantom Lady, Human Bomb, those the guys, characters that would yes. become the Freedom Fighters. Right. On their Earth, on Earth quality, they won. Just like here, okay. the Allies won in World War II. We just had superpowers on. They discover Earth X an Earth where the Nazis are still in control. Mm -hmm. So they leave Earth quality, and they go to Earth X, and they form the Freedom Fighters there. So now we've got characters inhabiting other Earths than the one that they originated from. Uh -huh. Red okay. Tornado is originally both the woman with the bucket on her head from the 40s and the android, both. They're both from Earth 2. In the 70s, when Red Tornado joins the Justice League, he leaves Earth 2 and changes over to Earth 1. Oh. So now we start... Yeah. We're just, yeah, we're just hopping, huh? So now we start hopping. Now we start changing things. My yeah. credit is horrible on this Earth. I'm, I'm going to go over, over here, here and start yeah, over. That's right. <laughs> Bear, you got a house over on this Earth because I'm tired of living in an apartment, brother. That's right. <laughs> Well, and Barry at this point, boy, he gets into into some trouble because, you know, he gets retaliation on uh, Professor Zoom for having killed Iris, and he kills him. I mean, he just, wow. he kills him. How? I don't know. Um, I, di I didn't read into that that much. Um, I really want to track those issues down yeah. really badly. Yeah, let's say he does um, the hand thing. That's how Zoom kills Iris. Oh, wow, okay, so he, yeah. He does the vibration hand thing, mm -hmm. I think, in her head. 
Whoa. Whoa. I want to say that's what I read, but he does it in her head. I just got shivers. So Flash goes after Zoom to kill Zoom and succeeds in the 30th century, I believe. And he's put on trial for it. They they catch him? They they get Flash and they, they put him on trial. I think everything eventually ends up working out and and he's able to show them that this is why it happened reverse flash was involved he was controlling things you know and eventually he gets exonerated Mm -hmm. but yeah that's a that's a huge major story towards the end of the flash run wow while this is going my murder was less evil than the evil man's murder (laughs) right right yeah my my murder was justified while his was not he was just being a dick while all of this is going on over in Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, number 133, we're introduced to a whole new concept, the fourth world. Yes, finally. As created by Jack Kirby, also known as the home of the new gods. Which originally had no connection had whatsoever. no connection. Until now. Thank God for Jimmy well, Olsen. Well, until Super Team Family number 15. Say that one more time. <laughs> Super Team Family, number 15. (laughs) In Super Team Family 15, Flash ends up meeting up with the New Gods. That really starts to integrate the whole New Gods thing into DC continuity and making a part of it. And I don't believe that they're necessarily a separate Earth, but they're also not quite an alternate dimension. Hmm. Because there's a difference between that, as I've discovered. Characters like Captain Carrot and the Amazing Zoo Crew, Mm -hmm. they are not on... I want to say that they're on Earth C, I think, maybe. For Carrot. For Carrot. (laughs) I don't think that that is technically an alternate Earth, because I think that's a pocket dimension. Sure. Okay. So now, now, now my head's just makes sense now it's to getting me. now it's getting crazy. Yeah. Now it's getting confusing. So and I, and I'm not sure. I think that the fourth world and the new gods land somewhere in between alternate Earth and alternate dimension. So there's somewhere in between there. I say it would point. make a little bit more sense if you if you had a numbering system for actual multiverse. I agree. Places and then you designate the letters to the your your. Pocket dimensions, pocket dimensions or yeah, like, your yeah. out out of sync with space time right, dimensions, right. but unfortunately they didn't do that. And <laughs> well, of course not. So you know we're we're <laughs> left we with trying to yeah right. We, we, we wouldn't have a podcast it. right now. One thing that I did find interesting, I, I'm always a big fan of crossover books. Okay. I love crossover books ever since the Spi- the Superman Spider Man book in the in the 70s, <laughs> the oversized Treasury edition. Right, I love them all. Even the bad ones like Marvel vs. DC in the 90s. I just love them. Malcolmverse. And the the, uh, the advent of the Malcolmverse, yeah. I voted one, for that stuff. I did, Thank too. Thank you very much. I did, too. One book that I've always loved was the Teen Titans and the Uncanny X-Men crossover. I don't know why I've never read this. I'm surprised that you've never read it, actually. <laughs> I think it has something to do with, at the time, I didn't give a damn about, about the, who the yeah. Teen Titans are. Well, I just always thought that those were just one-offs they're just there apparently dc designated and i forget what the designation is but they did designate an earth for the crossovers so Hmm. all of these crossovers take place on a separate earth so what do you have you so we have letters we have numbers what is this now i forget what this this one is called hyphens dashes i forget this is earth ampersand yeah (laughs) yeah there you go well it's in this book and this is the only one that I that I can think of that does this, that sets something up that's actually continuity worthy. This is the book that sets up the source wall. Oh, okay. Up until now, Darkseid's always going after the anti-life equation. But this, it's Chris Claremont who creates the concept of this source wall at the edge of the multiverse. Hmm. And in theory, the anti-life equation is held behind it. Now, it is discovered much later that, that that's not the case. The anti right. equation is not back there. And there's not a whole lot to go into on the source wall at this point in time. That becomes very, very important when you get to Rebirth. The source wall is everything when you get to Rebirth. But that's a season away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert, there's right. a Denny's behind it. You know, they start integrating the Dark Side and New Gods characters more and more, and they start to bring them into the Legion. There's a, a very famous... 
the Great Darkness Saga that took place in the Legion book. Yeah. That incorporates every single Legion of Superheroes character at that time. And I want to say this is like 1980 now we're up to. So we've got a crazy amount of Earths. We've got alternate dimensions. We've got all this crazy stuff going on in DC. And now we're starting to to cross-pollinate Earths and create these massive storylines with major characters that have major repercussions. This is when Marv Wolfman and George Perez sign on at DC Comics. Oh. And they give us the new Teen Titans. And they give us characters like Starfire and Cyborg. Yeah. And Beast Boy Changeling as we know him now, as well as the Teen Titans themselves. They also, I, I want to say, are instrumental in giving us Nightwing. Mm-hmm. So in New Teen Titans number 21, they introduce a character in the shadows, watching over everything, known as the Monitor. Now, initially, the Monitor was just supposed to be a cataloger. He was like the Watcher for Marvel. Okay. But then they started building up this story. As the story started to build, they realized that the Monitor was the piece that they could use to connect this story and connect everything. The thought was, we need to clean this up. We need this to make sense because mm-hmm. it's now way too convoluted and very, very difficult to follow. Now the building is on fire. Right. Maybe we should address this issue. Right, right. They create the monitor. And at first, what they say is that the monitor is supplying villains all across the multiverse with weapons. He is essentially played up as the next big bad okay. at DC. You come to find out later that what he's actually doing is he's putting major tests in Hero's way all across the multiverse, trying to find the greatest heroes out there because those are the heroes he'll need to get to save the multiverse because something has happened. Something's been unleashed. (sighs) What could it be? In order to help him gather all of these people, he travels to Earth Prime in New Teen Titans Annual Number 2. There is a young woman, young girl, I guess at this point, Lila Michaels, who is shipwrecked. I think she's she's floating, actually, in, in the ocean or, or somewhere. And he saves her, and he raises her, and he bestows powers on her. This is the girl that will eventually become Harbinger. Okay. And this is his, his right hand, and she is going to assist him in what is coming. While all of this is occurring, Flash has been exonerated. And he has now discovered, in, in the way that only comic book magic can, can be, he has now discovered that Iris, her mind or her essence or something was saved by her birth parents in the future. And she was <laughs> I love the look sent. on Mr. X's face. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. This was like, what in the world? Uh, she was sent to a different body, I guess, in the 30th century or something mm-hmm. like that. Flash finds her, and they're together. And in issue 350 of The Flash, he retires from being a superhero. God, I thought you were going to say Zoom kills her again. Damn it. I don't believe you. I think you're lying, sir. Shenanigans. That's just too ridiculous. I don't believe you. (laughs) You're making that up. I wish I was. Yeah, in issue 350, he retires, and that's it. The Flash is done. He's not going to be a superhero anymore. And he uh, he retires in the 30th century? In the 30th century is where he retires. Yeah. I guess it beats Boca Raton. that's that's (laughs) That's where he wants to go. There are many other Earths and uh, many other alternate timelines and characters that get introduced, but that's kind of the major stuff. This all leads up to basically DC Comics Presents number 78. Now, the story itself, I don't think, really has a whole lot of bearing on anything. Okay. But from what I've understood, from what I can find, the last page of that book is the Monitor, watching over the characters, watching over Superman, and trying to determine whether or not the heroes that he just watched in this issue are heroes that he needs to gather because a scientist on another multiverse, another Earth, wanted to conduct the same experiments as Corona. He wanted to see the beginning of the universe. And when he looked, when he tried to find out, he messed it up so bad that he let 
the Anti-Monitor, the Monitor's alternate brother from the Antimatter universe. Obviously. Obviously. Out. He let him out. He let him pass through to the Positive Matter universe, multiverse. And he is now going Earth by Earth and destroying them with antimatter and taking up the space, that the vibrational space that that Earth resides in with antimatter, which makes him stronger. And his intention is to do it to everything. And so at the end of DC Comics Presents number 78, we discover that this big event is coming. A crisis is coming. Now we want to know your thoughts on the early pre-crisis DC multiverse. Have you read any of these alternate Earth appearances? Were there any Earths that we didn't touch upon that you loved and want us to talk about? Head on over to our website and let us know. I think I'm just glad that we didn't they didn't just call Earth X Earth Nazis bad, don't go here. <laughs> like that seems to be the, the naming or, convention or, they were going with. It, it Earth is Hitler. in some in, in some cases. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the lasiest thing you can do, Earth Hitler. Yeah. Earth swastika. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm not quite sure uh where the naming process came from. Or I'm glad that came. it all gets taken care of though in, in the next big event. Things, it does. Bad thi- For a things while. have to get worse mm-hmm. before things get better. Yes. Indeed. Yes. And I guess that kind of sets up uh, um, our, our next that, yeah, uh, handful absolutely. of episodes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, that'll set up our next episode. And I assume that the, the we'll probably spend the entirety of the next episode dealing with crisis. Yes. Now, we, we call it crisis because we're in the know. So for any of you that are not in the know, it's actually short for crisis on infinite Earths. Right. The most significant storyline, in my opinion, that has ever happened in... DC Comics. And and I would argue one of the most significant storylines that has ever happened in comics, general. Mm. Right up there with the original Secret Wars and the Age of Apocalypse, and yeah, yeah. whether you like it or not, Flashpoint. Um, and we it, don't. It's... it's <laughs> It, it is, And it's the first of all of those. It you is, know what? I like the Flashpoint. Grand I don't like New 52. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I, I can get... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I like Flashpoint. I still don't. Okay. I like I like the, the the movie they did about it. We'll get to hear your thoughts when we finally eventually get to the episode ten years from now. Ten years from now, <laughs> I'll look for it in when the future we, archives. When we deal Are with Flashpoint, Iris West's out there. Yes, when Iris West in the 30th century is yeah. listening, that's when we'll finally get to that episode. But that's it, guys. That's that's um, obviously there's a lot that we we skipped over. I mean, we you know we're talking about. 50 years of, of history that we just crammed into one episode. Right. We can't take every single character and give you their entire stories throughout yeah. these ages. We would. That's a, to, that's a different podcast on a different Earth. Yes. But if you have one character or two characters in particular you want us to talk about, remember, you can always go to our Patreon and make us choose a Most Wanted. That's right. Slam Bradley. So you want a Slam Bradley episode. And, you know, similarly, Pistol, you know, you could go to the Patreon and and become a patron and pick one of the storylines that we talked about. If you want us to go into detail on the Flash of Two Worlds, if you want the four of us to sit down and read Crisis on Earth 1 and Crisis on Earth 2 and do a detailed episode on that, become a patron and let us know. We've dumped a lot of information on you, but we're only getting started. This is part one in a multi-part episodes that will spread over That's the right. next handful of volumes as long as we don't get canceled. So That's right. until next time, I'm Mr. X. I'm Pistol Danger. And I am Dr. Impact. Stay out of the multiverse, kids. Or Slam Bradley will get you. <laughs> That's our show, folks. Tell your friends and family about our program. What he means is you and everyone you know should subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. On every app possible. Want to help support the show? Visit our Patreon page. We have a variety of incentives at multiple tiers, sure to satisfy any and all hardcore geeks. You can also follow us on social media where we post weekly comic picks, breaking news stories, and glimpses into our everyday geek lives. Until next time, keep your turtle shells waxed, <laughs> your power rings charged. And your Proton Packs Prime.
Ooh, what's this do? No, Smurfy! Not the containment unit! Punch Hardly. That's what I should have called myself. Damn it! Punch Hardly? Punch Hardly. Punch Hardly. <laughs> when does Gorilla Grodd show up? Are we going to get to that? We are. Okay. We're going to get to that pretty soon here, actually. I like Gorilla That's the Silver Age. That's fair. Silver Age did love okay. the monkeys. <laughs> just, just reassuring, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Now that the I'm, Silver Age did yeah, love the monkeys. Yeah, now that they I'm did. rolling into my yeah, head, all right. Yeah. Monkeys, yes. gorillas, they everything were, in between. Thing, mm -hmm. then. Yeah. I actually wrote that down because I did a little bit of research, too. Ah. Oh. All right. Hear that, Smurfy? Pistol's trying to outshine you. <laughs> I, too, use the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we want to know your thoughts. Hey, fuck you. It's my turn. Oh, sorry. It's right. It is. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot. That's <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> sorry, I didn't tell you. <laughs> you're not offended, though, so you don't care. You got to ask I a forgot. question. You got to I ask forgot. a question. I forgot. I forgot. It's my turn. I forgot. 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 My turn. I forgot.